Hey everyone, I am here today with Jason Matthews, the designer of Twilight Struggle, one of the best selling, the best selling war game and historical game of all time, and the number one game on Board Game Geek for over seven years. It's one of my favorite games. Really pleased to uh, meet Jason and talk with him and be able to interview him finally. So hopefully we're going to have some good conversation. But we are here at Gamma Expo 2023, and Jason is also a member of the board. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, I know I've talked about it before, I've people like Kylie Primus before, um, but Gamma is the Game Manufacturers Association of America. And so, in fact, let's just start with that. Why did you want to be on the board now? Um, I mean, it, to be perfectly honest, I had been uh, critical of Gamma for a long time. Yeah. And so it was just one of those things where I felt well, there was an opening, and either I'm a jerk for complaining for 15 years and not doing anything about it, or I run to take the slot. And yeah. so I ran and took the slot. Um, like everything else, I think once you are on the other side of an organization and you begin to grasp why things are the way they are, you realize that, you know, you're, you're going to have to have some patience and incremental progress is what you should be aiming for. Yeah. And that's kind of where I am on, on Gamma. Yeah. Well, I mean, what would be something that you would like to see change in, in the future that would be like um, facing the general public maybe, uh, you know, because you're going to be involved in, in the direction of Origins, which is a great show to go to and things like that. What, what, what are some things you'd like to see change there? Well, there, there are two things that I care deeply about that I am interested in uh, making part of my board service. One of which is I want to see the conflict simulation companies return to participating in Gamma mm -hmm. because, you know, there, there was some ugly politics, just to be honest about sure. it, uh, that led a lot of the gaming companies that I care about and deal with more directly to leave Gamma many years ago now. All those people that they were concerned about are gone. Things and changed. <laughs> things have changed very much. And, yeah. you know, the Gamma itself has also evolved with the gaming hobby. So when card-driven games were all the rage, there was a lot of representation for them. When role-playing games um, kind of took over all of the gaming industry, the Gamma was more oriented towards that. But we're in an era where board games are dominating the hobby space. Yeah. War gaming is a critical component and the origin of the modern board gaming hobby. And I really think that the war gaming companies belong in that space and, and need to have a presence here uh, and in the hobby more broadly. Yeah. So switching gears some. As you continue to design, because I, I got to see a little bit, I didn't get to play it, but I got to see you have another version of Twilight Struggle coming out, uh, what, next year or two, something like that, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just sort of a question of, of um, GMT's printing schedule. Sure. Uh, ever since the problem with the Chinese printing, everything's a little behind. So uh, it'll be on the P500, I think, this coming month. Mm. And... Um, I got in some play tests at CircleCon, as you know, so yeah. that was great. And, um, you know, I'll be putting right at that for a while, I guess. Yeah. Um, and, and the title of that one? Again, it's uh, Twilight Struggle South Asian Monsoon. The South Asian Monsoon. So okay. it's obviously about the kind of Indian subcontinent. And what I've been, uh, like, unexpressly doing uh, with these two sequels is fixing things about Twilight Struggle that bother me a little bit. Okay. And yeah. one of the things that this addresses is I, I really, the China card yeah. thing is, it's cute. It's a gimmick though, yeah. right? You know, yeah. you trade back the China, back and yeah. forth the China yeah. card. So that's great. But having that in Twilight Struggle in the base game obfuscates a very important and very uh, vital element of the Cold War, which is this dance between India, Pakistan, and China. That's uh, what's going on in Asia yeah. is very much about that yeah. situation. And because China is totally abstracted in, uh, in Twilight Struggle, 
you miss out on that important element of Cold War history. That, yeah, that's interesting. I, I've been reading uh, Crisis Encounter right now about 1946 to 1950. Like, how do you stay engaged with, with, with your topics related to uh, game design? Um, I, I have a philosophy which is to find the best book, whatever yeah. the best book is. Yeah. But, um, and I start with that. Mm -hmm. And that gives me sort of the narrative arc that I'm looking for, hopefully. Yeah. Maybe maybe not. Maybe yeah, yeah. I'll read the best book and I'm like, this was not what I wanted. I yeah. have to find something else. But hopefully that happens. And then I try and uh, fill in gaps of specific things that I didn't know, either through additional books or articles that are mm -hmm. specialized on that topic. Um, in this case, there's there are plenty of books on India China and Pakistan and their relationship, uh, there are a ton of those books. Yeah. Uh, there are quite a few fewer books about the relationship with Sri Lanka and India or you know some of these other kind of smaller countries that I had to go do a particular dive to figure out what was up with them during the Cold War. I mean, you have access to the best library in the country. Really. So, so I do, <laughs> right? yes, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, with, with that, uh, right there, are the librarians su super helpful, or do you just go in yourself, or how does that work? The yeah. Library of Congress is one of the most amazing resources in the country, and it, I was a little, um, I was a little disappointed mm -hmm. in the controversy that surrounded that uh, pop artist using James Madison's uh, glass flute. Oh yes. And yeah. the, the reason I was disappointed in the controversy is there was kind of like, how dare she? thing about it. Why would she be allowed to touch James Madison's flute um, amongst people who were complaining about it? Right. And the truth of the matter is, the Library of Congress belongs to the American people, and yeah. all of us are entitled to go and utilize and access its resources. Anybody can go get a library card. I mean, they may not let you check out one of their copies of the Constitution, but, you know, right, uh, right. Uh, within reason, <laughs> right. whatever is uh, available to the U.S. government is available to you as a U.S. citizen. And so, I, if anything, I was like, people, all people should be doing more of this rather than less, and people shouldn't be criticizing others because they just happen to make use of the resources that the U.S. government provides. Yeah. Well, I, I wasn't even thinking about this at all beforehand, but it just popped in my mind. I know that they have the best comic collection in the world. They well, absolutely do. Um, I mean, almost all of them, I think. Yeah. So... I, I, do they have some of the old Avalon Hill old, old stuff? Like, like because that that's an interesting thing. Like, it, it's literature in some ways. Like, like, is anybody there curating anything like that? Do you know? Um. So, what, um, what I think has to be curated is uh, rules, and the if you file for copyright on your rule set, it has to be submitted to the Library okay. of Congress, and they'll have a copy. Yeah. So they probably wouldn't have the full games, but they would have okay. that. Okay, interesting. Um, I, whether or not they're collecting games just because they collect uh, Americana and you right. know, elements of our culture, I don't know. But uh, they might. Okay, I mean, just, yeah, that's a totally random question. Okay, what are you playing right now that you enjoy? I see you have Tori's game uh Probably on there. Votes for women from, uh, from Tori Brown. Tori's been on the podcast too. But yeah, what, what are you playing that you're enjoying right now and, and working through? It? I mean, that game. I, I, I very much enjoy yeah. her game. And for whatever strange reason, I'm not very prolific. I, as you know, like I put out a game maybe other every other year at best or something. But all of a sudden, I've been doing a ton of uh, my. I, I've just yeah, been yeah. in a mode where I've been designing stuff quickly. So uh, I've been doing a lot of my own. But the other thing that I'm working on is a new game called First Monday in October, which I'm not the designer, I'm just developing for Fort Circle. Uh, that is a, a full history of the US Supreme Court and uh, an extremely good game, multiplayer game. Um, so also off my beaten path, but I think it'll, since there is no real game on that subject either. It'll it'll make an important contribution. Yeah, uh, I mean, do you gravitate to 
playing two player games yourself then too? Is, is that it, part of what you're saying? Or? That's not really what I would say. Okay. Um, because for a very long time, I spent a lot of time playing Euros like everybody else because yeah, yeah. family and whatever. Um, more recently, my gaming has been, I've been back to more like war games more often. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, as far as what you would, I generally ask this question, advice to newer designers, or maybe a designer who has something out there and they're wanting to get into something more serious, uh, what type of advice would you give to them? Well, I think the, the thing for me that is always the holdup, I can design a game in my head for years on end. I just like play with the ideas all the time. Yeah. And that there's like a barrier, uh, a mental barrier between doing that and putting something on cards, index cards, or writing it down. Yeah. Just like there's a humongous gap. And I can't tell you why it exists, yeah. but it is the thing that new designers need to overcome. They just need to put pen to paper and start playing around. Yeah. Uh, and you'll make a lot more progress that way than you will just playing with it in your head, even though I'm guilty of it as anybody. Yeah. I mean, if we could go back to 2005, what advice would you give to yourself as a designer? Is there anything that you would change going on? Oh, I absolutely. Yeah. I would okay. change so many things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm, a lot of lessons learned from Twilight Struggle are incorporated into later games. Things that I have found out are just a ginormous pain in the ass that I will never put in another game again are in Twilight Struggle. Like anything with timing of cards, yeah. you just know you <laughs> are going to spend half of your fac debating about which card is supposed to. Go okay. in one hour's way. Okay, okay. I do not do those anymore. Um, Interesting. Okay. And so, yes, I, I, I have a ton of lessons learned from that, but but it was a great experience, so yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I don't have any, like, regret regrets about No, no. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I mean, that, that's interesting because there's a lot of people uh, who play Twilight Struggle more when they come to it. They, they, that pacing is important to them. Um, so... To hear to hear that, that, that that's, a, that's an interesting statement. Um, I've enjoyed the the Horn of Africa one a lot. I'm it's been a, a great one to introduce people to the game who are kind of they're, they're a little bit intimidated sometimes. So, and and um, what is that? How you intended that to be, or, or or what's the relationship there between that game and then the original? Yes, uh, I mean, I I feel compelled to express for the hundredth time that I. I have no intention of ever designing the exact same game again. Right. So, yeah. but although some, I know it disappoints people when they open the box and they're like, oh, another Twilight Struggle game. And then when they play it, it's not Twilight Struggle. I'm like, well, you have Twilight Struggle. Why, yeah. why did you want this game to be precisely the same? But it happens. Um, but in both this game and the next one, um, I have very specific goals, uh, mm -hmm. and the very specific goal for Twilight Struggle Red Sea was to um, provide an on-ramping for the full game. Uh, when we designed Twilight Struggle in 2005, it was a short war game. Three hours, uh, you know, <laughs> everything was going in this direction, 8, 12, 14 hours. Yeah. And we were like, ah, no, no, yeah. we, I don't have 8 or 12 or 14 hours, yeah. it has to be shorter. Well, a three-hour game now seems like a huge investment to a lot of people. And so we had, and so I, I, who knows how many copies of Twilight Struggle people have bought and are sitting on a shelf that have never been played, but a lot. I, I promise you it's more than one. And yeah. I wanted something to fix that. So um, Twilight Struggle Red Sea is not fewer rules. It's just as complicated as yeah. Twilight Struggle but it is much less of a time commitment. And um, it also has, it's a little more, um, because the deck is not so large, there's a, there's a little less gotcha to it in the sense that you, if you play it two or three times, you will understand everything that's available. Yeah. Whereas you can play Twilight Struggle two or three times and still have not seen very much of the late war and you don't know, you know, you can still get a gotcha card and you're like, ah, oh, I didn't know that was in there. 
What game would you want people to know about that you think that they might not know about? Um, well, so I mentioned this one a lot on podcasts because I think it's so clever. Um, and I think most people will have no exposure to it. Uh, it's called uh, High Treason, The Trial of Louis Real, which is a very small victory point game that takes card-driven design into the courtroom and uh, weirder than that into a Canadian courtroom, uh, into a colonial Canadian courtroom, and does so in an extremely interesting way. And I admire that design very much and you can pick it up relatively cheaply. So if you're a history game guy and you like card-driven games, I think it should be an auto-purchase. Excellent. Um, I mean, the, the hobby is, is starting to change, I think, in good ways. Uh, a lot of new different designers, we saw that at, at Fort Circle uh, Con. And um, what are some topics that you would love to see covered that you haven't heard talked about at all? Um, you know, even though we're starting to see a lot more geographic diversity, and I think that's fantastic, and you see it in these coin games, uh, the new one on the Philippines, the revolution in the Philippines is made of people power, I think. Um, so, but, <laughs> but we're just barely, just now, starting to itch or scratch at those itches. Like, there are a handful of games for all of South and Latin American history. There, you can all, you, maybe you count them on two hands, all of the historical designs that have been based in that area. Mm -hmm. And it's not because there was a shortage of conflicts. There are a ton of them. Right. But um, Americans aren't, you know, we're not schooled in that history unless you took specialized history classes in graduate school. You won't know practically anything about Brazilian or Argentinian or uh, Mexican history. And, um, and thank heavens, as the board gaming hobby is broadening, we're starting to see designs come from those regions that are helping portray that history. Um, because I think if we just wait on Americans to do it, it's going to be quite a bit longer. For yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you probably want to play it because you, have, you kind of already told me that you think about playing longer Euros, but I, I recently played that Brazil. Uh, it looks great. Yeah, it looks great. It's definitely like a Euro yeah. with the mechanics, but they had a separate booklet in it just about the history, and I love seeing that. And but it also made me want to like play more of a historical, <laughs> more of a historical game about it and, and do that. So I, I definitely hear you there. Yeah. Um, going in a weird direction. You play games with family. Do you, does your family play? your games at all? It, it's funny you say that because it, it took them a very long, I it, I never pressed it. Yeah. And when when Twilight Struggle came out, it wasn't really an option. My kids were too young. Sure. Um, yeah. But um, very recently, my son in particular has been very interested in participating in the play testing and whatever. So, yeah. so he played, he's played a lot of Twilight Struggle Red Sea and uh, is a little bit of a, a hype man for me because he, he likes teaching people when we're yeah. at game stores and things. So well, that's great. So that's nice. Yeah. So, and this is why I said it's a weird direction. When they were younger, would you play like trick taking games? Absolutely. Like yeah. Like, all, like, I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. I have a gigantic collection of games, or yeah, not, yeah. not anymore, but it, uh, by sure. my modern standards, but I had like more than 800. Yeah. And, you know, of that 800, maybe 150 were war game or war game magazines and everything else was euros and i had a ton of haba yeah. you know kids games and all that stuff and there's great stuff in there i mean really fun interesting games yeah um i mean that, that's good here so i know you get pushback <laughs> i know it's probably brought up in different podcasts before what's your response to the people who are like it's not really a war <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, fair it's enough. It's a stupid question. I, 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 the problem with any of these definitional debates is yeah. that we, they always, um, there's always a close case that no one can, you know, which, which side of the fence is it really on? Yeah. And that, for that reason, I have always preferred the term consim, 
conflict simulation because it incorporates more things that, as far as I'm concerned, are core parts of the hobby. Yeah. I'm old enough that I remember when I was young and first started out in the gaming hobby, it was board gamers, all of us, versus role players. All wow. of them. That's interesting. And yeah, okay. that was the us versus them debate. Yeah. No one ever asked, is Civilization a war game? No one. It's yeah. an Avalon Hill game. They're right. us. Right. It's not, it's not a role-playing game. That's clear. That's them. Yeah. Now, if Civilization had come out today, what would we call it? We wouldn't call it a war game, and we'd probably call it a Euro. Right. Even though that is a foundational game to war gaming. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, I, it's just human nature to like classify things up and push things Everybody up wants to be part of a tribe, and they want everybody else's <laughs> tribe to yeah. be bad and evil and yeah. over here somewhere. Well, th this has been fantastic. Anything else that you would like to say? Anything else that you'd like to highlight of you know, designers or whatever? Well, I'm very, I'm very excited about the direction of the hobby. I think uh, the hobby has never been healthier in my time in it. Maybe, uh, I, you know, I miss the golden era of the 70s or whatever when uh, Avalon Hill and SBI were both going strong. But um, I, and I'm excited to see women in the historical gaming space, uh, both in, as designers and players and... Um, I'm excited to see all sorts of diversity in that regard, not just because it makes the hobby a little more uh, accepting and, and a little more inviting, mm -hmm. but also because we get better history out of the deal. Yeah. And that's what I, at the end of the day, that's kind of what I care about. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, honestly, I have enough Gettysburg games, so I'm, I'm <laughs> eager to see something else. Yeah. Well Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, Jason.